Let's learn about the EM algorithm. The expectation maximization, commonly called the EM algorithm, is a way to find a maximum likelihood estimate for problems where we have missing data. Now, missing data can be understood as unobserved or what we call latent variables, which would allow us to solve for the MLE if we had them. Uh, and if we think of data in a spreadsheet, we are usually missing a column of the data set, right? A variable, not a row, not an individual in the data set. So first, we're going to look at an example of using the EM algorithm, and then we're going to understand what happens under the hood. So suppose we want to learn about the probability of heads for two coins, two biased coins, uh, coin A and coin B. So let's let theta A be the probability of flipping heads for a flip from coin A, and let theta B be the probability of heads for a flip from coin B. And we observe four sequences of coin flips, two from A and two from B. Now it is very easy to estimate the probability of heads for each coin since here we know which observations are from which coin. In these two sequences from coin A, seven out of the 10 flips are heads. So if we wanted to estimate theta A, which we might call a theta hat A, theta hat A is seven out of 10. That is our best guess of the probability of heads. And similarly, these two sequences are from coin B. And in these two sequences, only two of the 10 flips are heads. So our estimate theta hat B is two out of 10 or 0.2. This is just the maximum likelihood estimate of theta A and theta B. But what if we didn't know which flips came from which coin? So here, now we don't know the sequences. We don't have the color labels of which sequences from which coin. And in this case, it would be a lot harder to estimate theta A and theta B. So how could we try to do that? One solution might be to just guess which of the sequences belongs to each coin. So here we see that these two sequences seem to have more heads than tails. So we might guess that they came from the same coin. And these two sequences have more tails than heads. So we might guess they come from the same coin. Uh, and in this case, we would have been right. And this could work, but what if we're wrong? Then our estimates are going to be incorrect. So we want to be able to account for this uncertainty. And this would be especially difficult to just guess if there were many coins and many sequences uh, where there might be some overlap between and it would be really hard to identify for sure which sequence came from each coin. So let's allow for the possibility for us to improve our estimates if our initial guesses aren't correct. So let's try this idea. Let's alternate between two steps. We're going to guess which sequence is from which coin and then we're going to estimate theta A and theta B. And not only do we want to estimate which sequence is from which coin, but we want to account for our uncertainty. So one thing we could do is we could compute the probability of the sequence coming from each coin and take those probabilities into account in our calculations. So we want to guess which sequence is from which coin, but account for the uncertainty. And this will be our E step. We will take an expectation. And an expectation accounts for the uncertainty, right? It weights the possibilities by their probability. And this will be the M step, estimating theta A and theta B. We will choose the theta hat A and theta hat B that maximize the likelihood of observing our data. So this is just like maximum likelihood estimation in step two, where we're trying to maximize the likelihood. And we will actually alternate between these two steps until our estimates stop changing. So let's see if this idea works. So we're gonna use four sequences of 10 coin flips. So here we have four sequences of 10 coin flips. And the important aspect of this is how many heads and how many tails are there. So we can summarize this data as having three heads in sequence one, four heads in sequence two, seven heads in sequence three, and nine heads in sequence four. So here's our data. We have the number of heads and tails for each of the four sequences. And we start off with a random guess of theta hat A and theta hat B. And we'll talk about how we might choose these a little bit later on. And these are just our first guesses. So the superscript one means these are our first guesses of theta A and theta B, but they are, are going to change throughout this process. And the first thing we want to do is to compute the likelihood of each sequence under each of the two coins, right? Our current guesses of the coins bias that we have here. 
So here, this is just the binomial formula, okay? So if we have coin A, we can use the binomial formula to compute the likelihood of observing three heads and seven tails. And we can do the same thing with coin B, which has a 20% chance of heads. And we can compute the likelihood of observing three heads and three tails. Now, since we observed three out of 10 heads, coin B, which is heads 20% of the time, is going to be much more likely to produce this sequence. And we see that in the likelihoods. We see that this likelihood is higher than this likelihood. So coin B is about 19 times more likely. In a way, the probability of being from coin A is about 0 0.05, and the probability of being from coin B is about 0 0.95. Uh, we could see this formally with Bayes' rule. We could say the probability of being from coin A, given our data and our current estimate, and using equal prior probabilities, we would just use Bayes' rule. And because we have equal prior probabilities of one half, all of those numbers cancel out. And what we're left with is just the likelihoods. The point is, because coin B is 19 times more likely, we want its probability to be about 0.95. Okay, so that's all we're expressing here. So we compute the relative likelihoods for all of the sequences here. Uh, we see that these two sequences with fewer heads are more likely to come from coin B. And these two sequences with more heads are more likely to come from coin A. And since there is only a 0.0428 probability that this sequence came from coin A, we will only attribute 4.28% of the three heads we saw to coin A, okay? So this is what we were saying. We're not going to say 100% that this is coin B, but we're going to account for our uncertainty, and we're going to distribute the heads and attribute them to the two different coins. So 4.28% uh, of three heads is 0.1284 heads, and we attribute that many heads to coin A, and we're gonna attribute the rest of the heads to coin B. And similarly, we'll attribute only a few of the tails to coin A and most of them to coin B. And we're going to do that for all of the sequences. And again, we can see that coin A is being attributed most of the heads and tails for these sequences that were attributed to coin A. And coin B is being attributed most of the heads and tails uh, for these sequences that were mostly attributed to coin B. And now we want to figure out how many heads and tails in all the sequences are attributed to coin A and coin B. And we're going to do that by adding down these columns. Okay, so this is the total number of heads and tails attributed to each coin, which makes sense because A is mostly heads and B is mostly tails. And now that we have our best guess of the number of heads and tails from each coin, can we update our estimates of the parameters? Well, we can. We're just going to do what we would normally do. We're going to take the number of heads, right? So that's our number of heads, uh, divide it by the total number of coin flips. And now we see this is going to be our second estimate of theta hat A and our second estimate of theta hat B. And these numbers did change a little bit from 0.7 to 0.74 and from 0.2 to 0.343. And now these will be our new estimates of theta A and theta B. And we're going to repeat the same process. We're gonna compute the likelihoods given the new estimates. We're going to compute the new relative probabilities. We're going to portion out the heads and tails between the coins, accounting for the uncertainty. And then we're going to tally up the total number of heads and tails attributed to each coin. And we're going to use those attributions to get a new estimate, theta hat 3. And again, we see that our numbers change a little bit more. And then we keep repeating this process over and over and over again, and eventually our answers will settle down and stop changing. Eventually, we will reach a local optimum. Okay, so after 10 iterations, we sort of settled down on theta hat A is around 0.8, which makes sense because uh, we see around 80% heads here, 
and theta hat b is 0.37, which makes sense because we saw about three or four heads in these sequences. And that is the EM algorithm. Now, of course, the question is, what did we just do? How does it work in general? And why does it work? So what is the EM algorithm used for, and how does it work? Well, the EM algorithm is a method for estimating parameters similar to maximum likelihood. And it works when there is some concept of missing data. So in our coin flip example, we observed sequences of heads and tails, but we did not observe the labels of which sequences came from which coin. And by introducing the missing variable, which coin the sequences came from, we actually make the problem easier, right? If we had those missing variables, we could solve the maximum likelihood estimate we saw. Um, and by introducing them, we were actually able to uh, use them in this creative way using the EM algorithm. And we'll see exactly how that works. Uh, so just to reiterate, uh, the maximum likelihood uh, estimation is sort of just like the M algorithm, the M part of the EM algorithm, right? We're going to choose the theta that maximizes the likelihood and uh, that, that's it really, right? We can do this because the likelihood is relatively simple, um, or we can at least write it down because we have all of the information. Uh, whereas the EM algorithm, we want to choose the theta that maximizes the likelihood, uh, but this is hard because we have that missing data. So to find the theta that maximizes the likelihood, we try to fill in the missing data, and then we find the theta that maximizes uh, the, well, the not really the likelihood, but the expected likelihood. And we'll see exactly how it uh, maximizes this certain function we'll call the Q function. And we're going to repeat uh, this until we are happy with our answer and it stops changing. Okay, so here is the EM algorithm. We're going to find the Q function, which is related to the log likelihood function, but is based on attempting to complete the missing data and accounting for the uncertainty. And we're going to maximize this Q function which improves the likelihood too. And we'll see why that is the case. And we're gonna repeat over and over until our answer stops improving. So let's try to understand the math a little bit more. Okay, so we wanna maximize the likelihood. Uh, well, and really we wanna maximize the log likelihood. So uh, we're just gonna have this be the log likelihood and we'll clarify it there that we are talking about the log likelihood we're gonna maximize. And Again, we said this is hard. It's hard to maximize the log likelihood, and we're going to try to make it easier by introducing two ideas that might help. One, we're going to introduce the missing data or the completed data, right? So the completed data is the data we have plus the missing data. So we're going to try to introduce a missing variable, and we're also going to introduce this idea of our current estimate of the parameters and see if that idea helps us as well. So we're going to take this equation here, and we're going to try to introduce these, uh, these two ideas into the equation, and we'll see how this is going to help us. Okay, so right away, we're going to introduce the missing data. So we're going to let C be the complete data, which contains both the original data, which we'll call X, and the missing data. Okay, so this step here is just sort of using properties of joint distributions, right? We're going to use the joint distribution of X and C, and we're going to integrate out C. Okay, so these statements are equivalent uh, using properties of joint distributions. So we can rewrite the likelihood by introducing the joint PDF of X and C, and then integrating out C. Now, since the complete data C contains the data we have X, the X is really redundant. So all this step here is, is the fact that C contains X. So I can just forget about X and it's really the same thing. And that is what we did here. Uh, now this is where things start getting a little bit weird. So we are going to be estimating the parameter theta repeatedly. So let's let theta hat T be the estimate at time T. This is the same notation we saw uh, well, we saw the example. And what we're going to do here is we're going to multiply by 1 in a complicated way, right? So we see, we just multiplied by this divided by this, which are the same thing. So we just multiplied by 1. So we didn't really change anything. Nothing is changing here. And we can rewrite this new expression as an expected value, okay? So we have a quantity times a probability integrated, which is an expected value value. Okay, so we have the expected value of this quantity. 
And this notation here is just to help us clarify a little bit what we mean by the expectation. Well, we're trying to complete the data. So it's the expectation over all possible ways we could complete this data, which we aren't really sure about. But we do know the data that we saw, x, and we do know the current estimate of theta, theta hat t. Okay, and now what we can do is we're going to try to move that log inside of the expectation. Now we can't do that exactly, uh, but we can take advantage of something called Jensen's inequality. And uh, we move it, uh, we move the log inside and we get this uh, inequality here. Okay, so this is called Jensen's inequality that allows us to do this. And now by properties of logarithm and expected value, uh, we can just separate out the top part and the bottom part of this expectation into two different parts, right? So we got the first part and the second part here. And uh, now we're basically done. And we're going to call this first part here, this is our Q function. And this is going to be key uh, for solving this problem. Okay, so we call the first part the Q function. And what is this a function of? It's a function of theta and our theta hat t. And this second part, which we might call the h function uh, or the differential entropy. Uh, we don't really need to use this terminology. We don't care about this part because it's not a function of theta, which is the thing we're trying to solve. So we're going to uh, completely ignore the second part here, h. Okay, and if we just summarize uh, everything that we uh, just looked at, right, we see that the log likelihood, we found a bound on the log likelihood. Okay, it's at least q plus h. Okay, and how does this help us? Okay, so the EM algorithm works by improving the Q function because it's too hard to improve the likelihood function. And why does improving Q improve L? Well, we just showed that uh, the likelihood function is at least Q plus H. And another thing uh, here, if we take the exact value theta equals theta hat T, then this statement here actually isn't even a random variable. It's just a constant. And what that means is this, expect, uh, this inequality here is actually going to be an equality. Okay, It's going to be an equality at this one value in particular. Uh, and we're going to see an illustration of that later when we visualize the EM algorithm. Okay, But at one point, that is an equality. Okay, so at theta equals theta hat t, this statement is an equality. And if we combine these two equations, what we can actually show is that L theta minus L theta hat is at least the difference of these two Q functions. Okay, and why are we doing this? What does this mean? Well, what this means is when we improve the Q function, okay, when we move from theta hat t to a new value of theta, okay, when we improve that, right, so the improvement is quantified by the difference between these two equations. When we improve the Q function, well, L, the likelihood function, is going to improve too. And it's going to improve by at least as much, okay? So what we just proved here is that when we improve Q, we improve the likelihood. And this is the key to the EM algorithm. By improving the Q function, which we get by attempting to complete the missing data, we actually improve the real likelihood function. And we do improve Q at each step. Okay, and we're going to see Q here very soon. Okay, so in the M step, what we do is we maximize the Q function. Okay, so we make our new theta hat t, theta hat, uh, theta hat t plus 1. It's the theta that maximizes the Q function, right? So we can choose. What's our new theta going to be? Well, we can choose anything, and we're going to choose the one that maximizes this function, and we're going to call that our new estimate of theta hat. Okay, so by definition, because it's the argument that maximizes the Q function, our Q function at theta t plus 1 is always going to be an improvement over theta hat t, or else we wouldn't have changed to our new estimate. Okay, and because the Q function improves, or at least doesn't get worse, the likelihood function is going to improve at each step as well. Okay, so maybe we're starting to understand this, but where is Q? Where was Q in the example we just worked on? And where did we maximize it? Okay, so let's remember, what is the Q function? 
and we showed that the Q function was this expectation of the log of the probability of our complete data given theta. Okay, well, what's our log likelihood of our complete data? Okay, now this is just the binomial distribution. Okay, so uh, our data, right, followed the binomial distribution. We're going to take the log of it, and uh, we have four sequences that we observed, right? So we're going to sum over those four sequences. Okay, so this is just the log likelihood of four binomial observations, uh, where xi is the number of heads that we observed in the ith sequence. Okay, and I want you to keep an open mind here about the notation here. These thetas, we don't really know if they're theta A or theta B, right? That's the entire issue that we're running into. So I just want you to keep an open mind. And you can, of course, uh, work on this problem yourself and create your own notation that helps you understand exactly uh, what we're doing. And I recommend you do that as an exercise. Okay, so these thetas are either theta A and theta B, but we don't know. Let's keep an open mind. Okay, so all we're going to do here is we're going to use properties of logs to basically bring these xi's out in front. Okay, so this is just a property of logarithms that we used here. All right, so I'm, now I'm just giving ourselves some more room to write here. And an expected value is a sum of a quantity times a probability. So let's try to uh, incorporate that. We want to sum over all the possible completions of the data. Okay, and that means whether each sequence is a or whether each sequence is B. Okay, so uh, the way I'm going to write this here is we're just going to sum over A and B. Now really, we're summing over all possible completions, but because of linearity of expectations, uh, we can sort of uh, rearrange a lot of these terms uh, nicely. Uh, and again, uh, if you want to work through this problem yourself, um, I, I suggest you kind of convince yourself uh, of some of these uh, finer details. So here we have this expectation, and it's a sum of the likelihoods times the probabilities, and we're going to actually move this probability uh, just inside of uh, inside of this sum here, okay? And uh, we can do that because of properties of uh, linear combinations and expectations. And don't worry about these steps too much if you're having a little trouble fo following. It gets a little confusing with all the different types of thetas, and uh, these quantities here are simply the expected, or what we call the attributed number of heads and tails uh, when we worked through the problem. Okay, so I'm just going to rewrite those as the attributed heads for sequence I and the attributed tails for sequence I. Okay, and uh, now we uh, have another simpler way to write the Q function. Okay, so now we have our Q function, uh, and uh, it uh, actually simplifies very nice. So when we have H A and H, uh, T A being the total attributed heads and tails to coin A and coin B, right? Because our it's this is not our observed data because our observed data we don't know whether it's A or B. These are the attributed things we saw in the last two columns of our example, and the Q function ends up uh, being very nice. So even if we didn't follow all the steps to get the Q function, I just wanted to prove to you that we actually do end up uh, with an expression that is relatively simple here. So we completed the E step. We found the Q function. And now we do the M step where we maximize the Q function. Okay, so we have this function and uh, we're maximizing it. And remember, we have two variables here, theta A and theta B. So we're going to maximize uh, by taking partial derivatives. Okay, so what is the derivative of the Q function with respect to theta A? Theta A is only involved in this part and this part. And if we uh, take the derivative of that, we end up with this expression, and we want to maximize it, so we're going to set that derivative equal to zero. Okay, and here uh, we're just doing sim uh, some simplification by multiplying through by theta a and one minus theta a to get rid of the fractions. And we can distribute things, rearrange a little bit, and what we end up with at the end of the day is we want to solve for theta a, and we're going to call that estimate theta hat a, and what is theta hat a? Well, it's simply the attributed number of heads over the total number of coin flips attributed to coin A. Right? This is exactly how we updated our estimates in the example. And for theta b, uh, everything is exactly the same, right? So similarly, we could estimate theta b uh, by just taking the heads attributed to B over the total number of coin flips attributed to B. And that's exactly what we did. So we did 
do the M step in our example. We maximize the Q function by following these steps. So we completed the M step. So let's try to visualize a little bit how the EM algorithm works. And you'll often see these uh, diagrams uh, when you are learning about the EM algorithm. Okay, so we want to maximize the likelihood function. So here's our likelihood function or our log likelihood function. Uh, and here, of course, uh, this is just a one dimensional picture. So uh, with us, with theta A and theta B, uh, this would be more of a two dimensional type of surface. Um, but here, we're just going to visualize it in one dimension. Okay, so here's our likelihood function. And here's our Q function, right? And we said the Q function is equal to the likelihood at one point. Uh, but below it everywhere else, right? So remember, we proved that uh, there was an equality at that one point, uh, theta equals theta hat. Uh, but everywhere else, it's below the likelihood function. And that's what we see here. Okay, so in our Q step, what we do is we find the Q function. And then we maximize it. So how do we maximize this function? Well, we find the point where it's maximized. And in the EM algorithm, this is often going to be very easy because often our uh, function is going to be uh, convex or, or s simple in a way uh, that allows us to maximize it. So we saw in our example, uh, we just took the derivatives and we were able to easily maximize the function. Okay, so we maximize that function and now that is going to be our new estimate, theta hat two. Okay, so that's our theta hat two. And now we repeat, we find a new Q function. Okay, and that Q function is going to meet at that one point. Okay, so again, Q is equal to L at the value theta equals theta hat. And then we maximize Q again. And this is our theta hat three. And we're going to repeat by creating another Q function. And we're going to maximize it again. And you see, we're getting higher and higher on the likelihood function. And eventually, we will reach the local maximum. Okay, and that local maximum is the global maximum as well. So the EM algorithm succeeded here. Now, if we had started in a bad part of the likelihood function with our initial guess, we may have gotten trapped in a local maximum, right? So it'd be bad if we got trapped in one of these spots here and said, hey, that's our maximum estimate, but really we want to be here. Uh, and this is what I was talking about when we started the example. We started with initial random guesses of theta A and theta B. And what we can do to avoid uh, this problem is we can choose many different starting points, right? So if I chose a whole bunch of different starting points, then at least these ones in the middle here would end up in the maximum, uh, the global maximum, okay? So we can avoid this issue by choosing many different starting points and just run the algorithm for all of them and choose the highest one. So if we run the EM algorithm from all these starting points, at least some will end up in the global max. And now let's just look at one more common use of the EM algorithm. So this is a Gaussian mixture model. Suppose we want to learn the centers of these two normal distributions, and we'll call those theta A and theta B. Now this will be hard because we won't actually observe the bell curves here, right? We will just observe samples of data. Okay, so it just got a lot harder. We just got rid of the bell curves. Now we only have data. Now, this actually wouldn't be too bad if we had the clusters here, right? So we could just estimate the centers by the averages of the yellow dots and the averages of the red dots. But if we don't know which point came from which distribution, this is really hard, right? So this is just like we didn't know which coins came from each sequence. We don't know which point came from which distribution. And it's especially hard here because there was a lot of red, yellow overlap in the middle. I don't really know necessarily these points in the middle where they're coming from. So there's overlap in these distributions. So what we can do is we can use the EM algorithm like this. Let's choose some starting guesses for theta A and theta B. And when we actually run the algorithm, right, we might choose multiple places to start guessing. And given these current estimates, let's assign how likely each point is to belong to each cluster. Okay, so uh, we see here, uh, these points over here are very likely to belong to cluster B because they're closer to the center here. And these points are likely to belong to cluster A. And then we have some points in the middle here 
uh, which are vague, right? So that's why I made them orange, so that we don't know really what cluster they're coming from. And of course, all of this, uh, all of these in a way are really uncertain, um, but it's just to what extent are they uncertain? And that's why we calculate the likelihood of it coming from each cluster. And then what we do is we use these soft cluster assignments, soft meaning uh, they're not uh, definite, right? We have probabilities. Uh, we use these uh, cluster assignments to guess the centers again. Okay, so we're going to update the centers. And now we have new estimates of where the parameters are. And then we're going to reassign probabilities to all these points. And we're going to keep repeating that. We're going to update our parameters, assign things to clusters, and keep repeating. And eventually our estimates will stop changing. And that tells us that we found a local maximum of the likelihood function. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe to learn more statistics.